big bass around. These are about half of what I have. Uh, I've got several more at home I didn't bring, but probably I've done around 400 or so skip watercolor sketches on my travels. Uh, the it's uh, everything in these books took no more than an hour, some as short as 20, 30 minutes. And what I'm going to show you today here is how I basically do this. Basically, it is going to be a one or two minute drawing, a very quick drawing. Then you start putting the watercolor paints down. And probably the longest period of time is sometimes you have to wait a little bit before you can put the ink down. And I, a lot of people do some of these that you might have seen before, where some people do a very detailed pen and ink drawing, and the, <clears throat> excuse me, then they start painting within the lines. Mine is exactly the opposite. Quick pencil drawing, paint down on the paper quickly, uh, then you bring out the details by putting the ink in there. Some of the ones that are in here that you may, you probably couldn't tell which ones they were, but some of them you might not even recognize what the subject matter was until the ink went in. And so this is my way of just doing something quickly and loosely, which I totally enjoy compared to doing some of the studio type paintings. But uh, the title of this is from uh, the Amazon to Iceland. And uh, of course, there's a lot more in here besides just those two, but uh, I just finished going in this last year back both to the Amazon and to Iceland. The, uh, uh, and what I'm going to do today is a very quick demo, then take questions. And in fact, while I'm doing this, at any time, you can ask me a question while I'm doing this. It won't bother me to. Uh, interrupt me or anything like that. When I when I sit down here and do this, when I'm um, on location somewhere, it's really quite interesting because I run into uh, people and I start talking to them and find out an awful lot about it while I'm painting. And, uh, met a lot of friends from all around the world. And uh, but uh, <laughs> you can ask me questions anytime. It won't bother me a bit. So. Uh, any questions so far? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, this is, I think we got this lined up pretty good. Uh, th basically, what you need, this is something that uh, I've had for a while. You can find these things online. Everything that I need, I carry in this little pack. It's got, uh, the book fits in there, this little travel palette. I have just a little cheap thing with the bamboo to put my keep my brushes in. I never take my good brushes because you lose them. Uh, you know, you, you'll <laughs> you get busy, you forget about them, you're out there somewhere, you lose them. Just a little bag to carry some of the incidentals in. Uh, but this is really all you need. This one even has a little thing you can stick your cell phone in a little slot there. So, and there's certain things you know you can carry. Water in a bottle like this. They make these collapsible ones. Uh, they make pallets a lot smaller than this. So you got a lot of choices. And I don't try to tell anybody about what colors they need because this is all very direct paint. You know, use whatever colors you got. Doesn't make any difference. Uh, but uh, you can see here, uh, this is a, a picture that I took. And we were on a boat moving quickly. And this is something you could even do. I've done this on some occasions uh, where you're on a moving boat or you're so, you, you can't do it from a bus or a vehicle, obviously, but something that's moving fairly slowly, you can literally just quickly sketch, in this case, just this part here with a little uh, cottage or hut in here on the edge of the water, put that in there, and then paint the rest of it after you've gone past it. So and this is how quickly you have to work. So I'm going to show you real quickly, and I'll take questions as, as I say, uh, what you're going to do. And, and here again, one to two minute drawing is all you need. You're going to do a lot of drawing with a brush instead of trying to do all the pencil detail. The other thing that I will tell you, if you try to do this, 
fine air journaling, everybody will have a problem with perspective. Um, and people, when they're doing a studio painting, you will find that almost everybody now is either tracing it or projecting it or doing something like this. So your, your perspective, you're not having really ha knowing how to understand it. You're just getting it on there just the way it is on your photograph. And, uh, but when you're out there in real life, and you're sitting there looking in front of it, perspective lines get all screwed up. And I've done enough workshops in this that the first thing I found out the first day everybody tries to do this, they're lost. they got perspective lines going off in every which way direction and don't realize it. And so that's the thing that you're really going to have to do. You do any type of thing that's a street scene, architectural buildings, which is mostly what you're going to be doing, uh, you know, you get people get lost. So you've got to thoroughly have some understanding of perspective. Otherwise, your your initial layout and drawing. The other thing is, you've got to people I've seen sit down there and they can't figure out where to start the painting, and they will draw a race, draw a race, draw a race, and do this. And there, an hour later, they still haven't gotten their one minute drawing down. And, uh, and I mean, it, it's, it's common because you don't have these aids in there like you do in the studio. So you've got, you've got to sort of pick where you're going to go, where you, how you're going to put it on the paper. So basically, the golden mean or rule of thirds is something I use in almost everything. And if you, you can see in this picture right here that this right here is a center of interest. This is lined up essentially on the rule, the rule of thirds, or golden mean. It's about a third of the way from here, a uh, third of the way from here, centered in here. And you can, what you do is that you basically simplify this thing, decide on what's going to be your center of interest, line it up on your paper, put that in there first. Everything else builds around it. There's a lot of complex th theories and all people will try to tell you about how to do this. That's the simplest way I've ever found. You, you look at your center of interest, decide on what's in front of you that's important. You do not have to put everything in the painting that you see in front of you. It's not necessary. It'll drive you crazy if you try to. Move trees around. Change the angle of the street a little bit. Put trees in there maybe where they don't to help improve your composition. So basically that's what you're going to do. Um, okay. I'm going to show you a one-minute sketch here of what you're going to do. I'm starting down here where I, where I want my center of interest. Basically, all you're doing is giving yourself a general idea of where you want things. And here, I'm going to sit down here and maybe... Put Put a tree up here that's not necessarily in that drawing. That helps give me my vertical thrust of the golden mean. Okay, that's all I need. That's less than a minute. And this is, you know, this is, you know, if, I, if I'm down there in a street scene, complex building outside of a cathedral, something like that, it might take me a little bit longer. But basically, this is all you need. So this is where you start out. And as I said, cheap brushes, don't take your, your good ones. The, uh, there are certain things, though, that when you're out painting, I carry these little clips. I put a sheet of paper towel behind where I'm working so it doesn't get through and mess up the paintings on the other side. I'll also clip this. If it's windy outside, you've got to clip it together. When you start painting outside, wind's blowing, this thing flips over, and everything's a mess. So you got to have something to keep these pages from flying around on you. I don't need it here today because there's obviously no, no wind blowing. So, uh, okay. Uh, the size, this is probably... 
I think this is about a six by nine, something like that. They come, you know, five by eight, six by nine. I don't, I don't carry anything any bigger than that because it won't fit in this. It gets too big. Some people have it much smaller. <clears throat> I've talked with Brenda Swenson, who's out in California, and uh, we got to know each other real, real well when she came to the watercolors, one of our judges, and uh, she. Uh, she would. She she literally had a little purse that she slung over her shoulder. She worked with a little palette about this big and a little tiny brush like that, and that's all she needed. Uh, so, the only other thing that when it comes to uh, women doing this plein air, the uh, you have to be careful taking off by yourself and wandering around. That's not something that you want to try and do. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit weird about that. I don't worry about it. I just, I don't look like a victim, so I just go anywhere I want to and never have a problem. Uh, so, but be careful when you're out trying to do this. Now, this is literally, I almost always start with the sky. This, as I said, this is totally different than anything that I do in studio painting. This is just direct painting, and you get it down quickly. And I work fairly wet on wet, so sometimes it takes a while for the paint to dry enough to where you can put the pen and ink on it, but not too long. And, uh, and I'll just work from the sky down. Is it not not in focus? <laughs> With what now? No, uh, uh, no. And you know, I just have sort of my favorite colors that I usually go to when it when it comes to I know you a lot of people are familiar with Ian Stewart's work and he talks about how you know how quickly you can do one and don't agonize over what you're trying to do. And uh, I am going to clip this down because it's wanting to buckle a little bit on me. As I say, this you have to work fast when you're doing this. You may be with a group of people. Uh, I've done some where I've been traveling with a group of people and only had maybe 15 minutes while they were taking a break. I'll whip this stuff out and get one of these done in no time. Sometimes I will have to wait and do the pen and ink later on when I get back. You know, this you you have to work fast. You can't uh, you can't waste time. Uh, no, I carry a big Nikon with a telephoto, which weighs more than this right here. So, so no, it's uh, people. You can take one with your cell phone, but Honestly, I just, I have trouble figuring out how to focus, get that thing in there, get it lined up. The other thing that I do, this uh, on my card here, you'll see there is one photo here of one, or a painting of one, of a woman that I took when I was in Siena, Italy, and it was... It was, uh, yeah. yeah, on the card, yeah. And I took that from about 100 feet across the street from her. She never knew I was taking it. So you can't do that with a cell phone. Uh, 
that uh, and I'll leave this building in here just leaving it as a negative shape and and people also forget to try to use the negative shapes when you're doing this because they'll sit and they'll see this building here and the first thing that they'll paint is that building and that's not what you do. Last thing is you paint is the building. You paint around it, and then all you have to do is put a few finishing touches in there, and it brings the building out. Uh, and that's the important thing to remember. Now, a lot of times when you're working on these, everybody says, well, what color are you using? Don't, wor don't worry about the colors. It's not, it's not important. <clears throat> and I, you know, sometimes I'll blot things off. It's a little bit wet. The paper's bending a little bit, so I might do that some, but basically... Try not to do that too much. I remember years ago taking workshops from various people, and and they'd you'd be everybody'd be sitting down there putting nice washes, big bold colors on there, and immediately taking their paper towel and blotting everything off. And I remember the instructor telling me, "Why are you doing that? Why are you bothering to put the paint down if you're not if you're just going to blot it all up?" And it, there's a lot to it. Hmm? Hmm? Uh, the type of book. Uh, <clears throat> the ones that are circulating around here, Dale or Rowney had one that was really nice. It had, Well, it has a little thing, magnetic thing. They don't make them anymore. So uh, uh, Stillman and Byrne is the best one now and I like the ones that have the ring binder because a lot of times when you're out traveling I'll be sitting there with the thing flipped over holding it in my arm and painting and using a ledge or something for my paint. So you're not always going to be able to have a nice little bench to sit on. You can't carry a stool around with you when you're when you're doing all this. So you just have to uh, do the best you can. But Stillman and Burn, you need at least a hundred and twenty pound paper. To do this. Okay. <clears throat> and if, if there have been times I worked out of the back end of my SUV or something like this, uh, you know, just because, but most of the time. The angle that you want, you're not going to be able to park your car right there where you want. You're going to, I've sat down in the middle of a field. I was over in Germany one time, sitting out in the middle of a field painting this church out in the distance, and, and some car pulls up along, and a, a couple of an Oriental couple were in there, and they asked me for directions in Germany. <laughs> you know, they don't expect to see some foreigner out there doing this type of stuff. I mean, I, every, almost everywhere I go, the local people are surprised that I'm from the United States out there doing this. So, anyway, it's uh,
Well, any you can find something almost anywhere you go if you've got good light, highlights and cast shadows and interesting shapes. And you can make a, a good painting as long as you got that. That's all you really need. And uh, so that's where you just have to use your imagination. The other thing too is use the biggest brush you can for as long as you can so that you don't waste time. While I'm doing this, I'll tell you a story about one of the reasons that I love doing this so much is because so many of the things that happen to you when you're doing it. I was in Prague, Czechoslovakia, or with a group, and they took us through the old town, and then they walked us across the Charles Bridge, and then said, okay, you know, you can spend whatever time you want here, and then you're on, you know, you're on your own. And uh, so everybody else sort of headed on back. I wandered down into the other side of the town, looking back towards the old town and the Charles Bridge, and I found this park where there was nothing but uh, locals in there, and it was just like probably a Sunday afternoon. They were all kind of out there having a you know gathering and talking. And, but I was looking for a comfortable place, and I saw this view that looked back across towards the bridge, and I uh, so I the only place I could find that had a place to sit on the bench was next to this little old woman with her shawl. And you know, I sat down next to her and she just kept looking back and forth over her shoulder at what I was doing. And uh, I, uh, I kept working on it. And she kept looking over her shoulder at it, uh, what I was doing, and uh, bless you. And uh, anyway, when I got done, I, I just sort of showed it to her, and and she just jumped up, came over and hugged me. I had no idea what she was saying, and then she called everybody over in the park come over and look, and they did, and they all shook my hands and were talking to me and check, <laughs> and had no idea what, what any of them were saying, but, you know, it was just, it was just one of these moments that, you know, it was just, it was so wonderful to be able to have that relationship with the people in that area, and, uh, uh I mean, that's one that I'll, I'll never forget, but it's, I mean, everywhere I've ever done it, literally, it's been a uh, total enjoyment as far as trying to figure out the, uh, you know, with the locals there and the inner reaction. And a little bit smaller brush now.
Sure. Have you ever thought of getting print in some of your journal pages? I do, on request. I've had, I've been in places where people stop and said, oh, I want to buy that. Will you sell it to me out of there? And I say, no, I don't ever tear them out. But I can get prints made of them uh, and then, uh, you know, mail them to you. So, yeah, I do that. But uh, it's, it's fairly common that people will stop and say, I want, to, I want to buy one of these. I want to buy that out of your sketchbook. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. But uh, it is, uh, I do sell a lot of them. I've got, you know, and then, and then some of them I do as, as gifts. I'm going up to, back up to Auburn Vet School reunion here in about a week and a half. And uh, um, uh, I went, one of my old classmates has a place in Waverly, Alabama, which is in the middle of nowhere, and an old home with a, and it had the old slave quarter still standing, and I went up there and did a sketch of that. So I, I just take my camera, take a picture of that out of my sketchbook, send it to a woman who does prints for me, she delivers them to me, and then I can send them out. So it's you know fairly easy to do. Yeah, yeah. I did that for 45 years, but I practiced full-time for about 25 and then I decided I wanted to cut back and uh, and go get into more of my painting so then I worked I sold out my share of the practice and uh, and uh, and then uh, And then started doing my watercolors more seriously. Yep, you can see some of them up here. Uh, there's, yeah, I mean, there's more of them than that, but uh, some of these ones of the horses jumping, that was the Red Hills equestrian event up in uh, Tallahassee. They don't do it anymore now uh, for some reason. I'm not sure why, but. Uh, the uh, okay now I'm gonna some of this I'm gonna go ahead and start putting a little bit of ink in in places where I can and just uh, help me get things lined up now the other thing too is that I'm gonna put paint this roof in here shortly but not quite yet. No, ink, ink is, this is a Statler pigment liner. It's waterproof, indelible, but it also is the only one I found that you can use on damp paper. You try to use anything else and it won't write on it. And these things right here, this paper is still somewhat wet, and right now I'm, I'm able to do some, some pen and ink on it with this. So... This one's a point three, but I got a point three and a point five. It's a Statler S T A E D T L E R pigment liner, and I use a point three or a point five. Yes, pigment liner, mm -hmm. and like I say, it's it's essentially uh, waterproof, indelible, and and you can use it on. You can use it on damp paper, and so it's uh, uh, the Statler. I think you can get it in the Office Depot. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, one thing I, years ago, I tried using one of these. Uh, uh, what is it? The ones that make all the magic marker stuff. Short, yeah, but a ultra fine tip, and and that that just doesn't work. It doesn't work on the wet paper. It bleeds through, and doesn't. this is to me is the perfect one that I finally found to work to do this. And uh, I'm 
what I'm doing now is waiting for this to dry around here so I'm working with the with the pen and ink and uh, so I can do that roof on there let's see how are we doing on time Okay, yeah, this is, yeah, this is about working out pretty close on my time, so. Yes, you may have a question? Yeah, oh. Yes. Camera. Uh, it's a Nikon D7000. It's that's a top of the line amateur level Nikon. I mean, you can, but I paid more for the lens than I paid for the camera itself. The lens is what's really important on, on one of these cameras. So. Hmm. It's uh, so it's which lens I'd have to I'd have to look back on the thing I, I don't I don't have it with me but it's uh And you know all of this when it, it's just like your basic principles of composition. You want to build up your lights and darks, build up your contrast in the center of interest, most detail in the center of interest, most interesting shapes in the center of interest. I mean, uh, you're talking about doing things while they're moving. I've been uh, on, uh, my son was with me on one trip when we went to uh, Panama Canal. We're coming back and we're sitting on the veranda out there drinking a beer and and suddenly another ship's, we're overtaking this other ship. You know, and I, and I, we're out of sea, didn't have anything to do. So I grabbed my paints and go out there and paint this ship that we're overtaking. So you, you had to work quick because we have maybe five minutes before we're going to be past it. So that's uh, kind of what you have to sort of think about. This paint's dry enough around here now to begin to lay in some of this color. And there's some on that. This is a clothesline out here. They all hung their clothesline out on these posts hanging out in front of their place. And, and you just sit down here, maybe, and say, okay, a um, little bit of push a little bit of interest and push some couple of little colors in there to bring that out. And Add a little bit more color to it there. Okay. Yeah, I could I could do a lot more. 
on some of these, but basically this is all you need. Uh, the uh, main thing is, and I'd, I'd just like to stress this again too, is that when you get out here, you've got to pick your what you want to paint. Decide on it quickly. Get it placed on the paper in the right spot. This all, it may sound like it's something easy to do. It's not. It takes practice and you have to do this. I've taught workshops in this and the first day, it's a disaster. <laughs> but but people, will, people will have, as I say, they will start drawing and then, oops, it's the wrong place. Whoops, the perspective lines are all in the wrong direction. Whoops, they start erasing, then they do it again. Still in the wrong place. It's too big. It's not going to fit on the paper. You know, you, you, you have to literally visualize this in your mind as to where it's going to go. And you're going to take, as I say, go back to your center of interest. Leave out the extraneous stuff. Move trees if you got to. Maybe leave some buildings out if you don't need to. You know, I've done a lot of these that you see in the book here. You might see that this is a four or five story building. Well, the thing might have been six stories. Okay. But couldn't quite fit on the paper plane that I had, so I leave a story off of it. And you, you don't have you don't worry about things like that. But if you get hung up on the details and try to put every little thing in there, it's not gonna work. Yes, question. Do you throw up with a pencil and you with a pencil well no. The question is do I draw with a pencil right away or with the ink? Okay. Uh, no, I never do the ink first. Never. A lot, uh, some of the people were in here earlier and we were talking before we really got started. And I always do the quick pencil drawing. And it encourages you to draw with a brush. So I think most of you have probably heard that term before. You draw with a brush instead of putting so much detail in your, in your pencil drawing. You draw with your brush, and you don't worry too much about staying within the lines. And you correct if you have to. If you got some of your lines are off a little bit with the colors, the ink will straighten them out, and you know you can make the correct. Sometimes I'll do some of these where I'll have a, a little bit of a perspective error where I put my color in. I just use the ink to to straighten that out and correct as I do it. So, question. Uh, no, it's just, it's just some of them I only had did one side, but a lot of them I've done both sides. Uh, and uh, sometimes, depending on whether I'm running out of pages or not, it would be when I do both sides. But you have to be careful when you're doing both sides. That's why this piece of paper in between it protects, and this is something, even if you don't have... Uh, and anything painted on the other thing, you'll still mess up a black sheet by you know color running around and getting off the paper that you're painting on, getting on the next page. So always take some paper towels and keep them in between the pages. You always have to do that. Now, if you don't work as wet, it's not as big a problem, but it's still something you've got to think about. So, yeah. Do you have time to? Uh, yes. Do you have time to there's, show there, there's some uh, of them painting in, the in Iceland where there's a lot of white? Uh, well, actually, there wasn't as much white <laughs> as I thought there was going to be. The glaciers that we saw were from about 15 miles away, and all you were seeing is on the sides of these mountain ranges. You know, it looked like just snow up there, and we asked one of the guides, and we said, uh, "What's uh, uh, where's the glaciers? And he said, oh, well, that one right there is just a snowbank. This one over here looks just like it is a glacier. And how do you know the difference? The difference is the glacier is a certain size and depth. And if it's not at least that, it's not a glacier, it's just a snowbank. At least that's what they told us. Uh, 
it was, you know, compared, I'd, I'd seen glaciers down off of uh, uh, Chilean fjords and down below Argentina, Ushaya. Uh, I've seen that. I've seen them uh, uh, in some other places. But, you know, th these in, in Alaska and Canada, but, you know, the, I didn't see anything like that. The thing about Iceland, just while we talk about that for a while, because basically this was about that, uh, Iceland was, I was a little bit surprised because I really thought that it would be a little bit more scenic, not in that we didn't enjoy it, but most of what we saw looked like a moonscape or a desert. Uh, there are supposedly rainforests in the interior. We didn't see those, but the, the area where we went, we went to a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site that was a geothermal site. And we got off the bus and we walked down a wooden ramp, and it's like a moonscape. Just you know, just <laughs> there's not a blade of grass, nothing green anywhere for miles, and. There's a place with a little hole in the ground with steam coming out of it. And this is a UNESCO geothermal heritage site. And then on top of that, we get there and we're maybe 50 feet away from where this little crater is with the steam coming out. And somebody has dumped, and I'm sure it wasn't just anybody, I'm sure it was the officials of people who maintained it, took a section of the wooden walkway and it was dumped on top of where the steam was coming out, and it looked like a trash dump that was on fire. I mean, you know, but it was it was very interesting. It was something I talked to a lot of people about, and they said it's beautiful, you know, seeing, you know, driving around in the countryside. We did see one of the Godafoss Falls. I mean, that was interesting. There are a lot of waterfalls there. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of interesting things that you can see but I didn't see close-up glaciers. I didn't see, we didn't see wildlife to speak of. The nearest thing they could, wildlife were sheep roaming around out in the hillside. No. Question, yes. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry? What month were you there? Uh, two months ago. So, yes. There's so much information about perspective, uh, videos, books. Um, uh, what would you recommend to help people there, there learn is more a, about perspective? Uh, there was an article that just came out by John Roman in, uh, I think it was Watercolor Artist Magazine back a few months ago. And actually, he featured one of my paintings in there, among well, with some others. And uh, and he got into some of the principles principles of perspective, the you know one point two point three point whether it's going up in the air and all this stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. Some of it is so technical. It's it's like you know almost like what architects must have to study in college. But you know if you learn the the, the basic principles of perspective that your lines of perspective have all got to go down to a vanishing point on the horizon. The horizon, you can't always see it unless you're out on the you know, ocean where you can see the distant horizon. But the horizon is a fictitious point that's behind everything, and including all your buildings and things like that, even landscapes. So, you know, the, you, just, you just have to, you know, just find something that's very basic. Don't try and buy a book that has... You know, the, the, this, this stuff, it, it would drive a, a mathematician crazy uh, you know, with some of it. So, you know, it, but you you got to learn the basics. You can't have like a, a building where the two lines of perspective on the building, the top and the bottom part of it, got to come together. You can't have them going off up to where they never meet. And that's, you have to recognize things like that. But, um, you know, I've been... I've done some of them where I'm working so quickly that it takes me a minute, and then I will realize it as I start to get down to it, and I'll correct. That's why I don't do the ink until last. I can correct those little mistakes with the pen and ink later on. So. Well, is it like, uh, 
it's above or below the horizon line, the, the lines. That you have to figure out where the horizon line is. Well, mainly you just have to sort of, here again, I'm lucky because my father was a professional artist who never did art, but he encouraged me. And when I was like 10 or 11 years old and was drawing, he said, you have a natural instinct for perspective. And I'm teaching people that I've been teaching in the classes locally for 20 years. And they, it's still, they've been struggling with it over and over and over and over. So anyway, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's just, it's just something you have to sort of learn some of the basics. And as I said, when I teach, when I teach a workshop, oh, speaking of teaching workshops, I've talked with Ron Malone, and we're going to coordinate. I haven't got any dates or times yet that are figured out, but uh, I'm going to work with him, and we're going to try and have a, uh, one of these journaling workshops in Winter Haven, which is close to where Ron is, sometime probably coming up in next spring winter or spring of next year. What we have to do is you, you want to try and figure out when to do these things when you're going to have good weather, no rain. No, not too hot, not too cold. I've, I've been in places where I've been doing this and I'm just burning up, drenched in sweat. And, and other times, there's some of them in there. There was one in uh, Antwerp when I was doing one. And there's a picture in there of doing the, one of these cathedrals in the background. And I was back down the main street on the where the bayfront was. Wind was whipping in there. It was below 32 degrees. And I'm sitting there trying to do this painting. And it doesn't dry. It, it, it takes forever in that kind of weather. Another time I was in, in Paris and in France on a barge trip. And it was 104 and 105 degrees with, with low humidity. And as soon as you wet the paper and put the pigment down, it just sucked it up and it was dry. So, you know, it's, those, those are not ideal conditions to try and do it. You want it on a day where it's clear and sunny, uh, not too hot, not too cold. But uh, I've, I've struggled through some of these <laughs> really wild, adverse climate conditions doing that. So, uh, but uh, any other questions? How much time we got now? About 15? 14 minutes. 14 minutes. Okay, we got plenty of time. Uh, what else can I tell you about? Question. What are your preferred paints? Preferred? Paints. Paints? Oh. Uh, as I say, don't get too hung up on them. Uh, I, I really like the Daniel Smith colors. Uh, I use a, used a lot of the Primatec colors. How many are familiar, people are familiar with those? The Primatec are these natural mineral pigments. Uh, some of them are from sort of semi-precious stones and stuff like that. Uh, but those are really great. Uh, I use a lot of golden colors. I use some Holbein. I use some uh, Winsor & Newton. Uh, occasionally I'll come up with some others. But uh, the... Uh, that's, you know, don't, don't get too hung up on it. If you just get good quality colors, you, you'll be fine. Question? The question is the recording. <laughs> um, on this particular slide that's showing right now, you talked about doing the sky first and then leaving the focal point to the last. Now, in a piece like this, where would you consider? Is it the ship that you would leave last? And yeah, then the ship. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's where all your colors are right there. Right. Now, trying so to you paint around that? Yeah, it would, be, it would be right in here. I mean, you can't say, is it up here a little bit more? Here? It's Basically, it's the mass of the ship. I mean, you know, you can't, when you're talking about rule of thirds or golden mean, you're not always going to be able to get it absolutely perfectly centered on that. But if you go into any museum with all the old traditional classic masters, you will see that 90% of them adhere strictly to the golden mean. And you know you can keep dividing this down 
the first time, and then you have the remaining rectangle, then you can divide that down, and you would have the primary, secondary, and tertiary centers of interest and in all these things. So you can, you can take this to the extreme. But if you don't at least consider this when you're doing it, and it's the same way when, when you're taking pictures that you might want to paint later on, line it, don't just sit down there and say, okay, I'll put the center of interest right in the center of where you're focusing. Line up your camera to where it fits the rule of thirds or golden mean. Talk to any professional photographer. This is how they always do it. Artists have got to learn how to do the same thing when they're taking their pictures that they're going to work from. Any other question? Yes. Same with everything. Maybe give you the microphone. <laughs> Go ahead and repeat it so everybody can. The choice of paints you use, you use the type of medium, would it be a palette, like a, like a two paint? Of course, it's a dry paint. Yeah, it's a dry paint. No, it's always two paint. No, I, I always just squeeze out what I need. The problem is when you're traveling, and I've never tried to do it yet, carrying tubes of paint in your carry-on. I don't know what TSA would do with it. Uh, the, and the other thing would be, I mean, the, with the dry, the dry paints and where you have the little cakes. I mean, th those would work too, but I prefer, I've never you really used those at any time. I just squeeze it in my palette and just carry what I have in my palette enough to last me for a couple of weeks or more. 